In the mid-70s, well, mm, I, I always listened to um, stuff that was older. I was really into the Shangri-Las and the Ronettes. Um, but of stuff that was more contemporary, it would be like Roxy Music and David Bowie and then, and then the Velvet Underground. I mean, I always liked the peculiar sounds of like the, dis the um, discordant sounds that were going on and Nico's deadpan voice and I loved all the lyrics. Um, obviously, it's about a sort of very underground, underworld sort of scene. Um, I mean, I can't say that I was in the same sort of scene in Edinburgh. I wasn't. But somehow I, I really identified with it very strongly um, and went to New York, you know, around about sort of late 70s, early 80s. And um, I just felt very connected to me. I, I can't say, can't verbalise that too well. You know, I think people look back on those times as though it was like a Pepsi ad, but it was overall sort of like, hey, let's go and have a band and let's do this. And wow, yeah, yeah, and you're my great friend and whatever. I, I don't think it was like that at all. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously I know a lot of people that are involved um, broadly in the music scene, but I mean, I felt that it was so competitive that, I mean, I felt that the Rosillos, for example, were very much in her own pod, you know, and um, also, I mean, the Rosillo started off very early um, before some other things came on board and we were not part of a scene at all. We were totally alien. We were like, it's like, I don't know how we landed in this sort of situation, but we came out of nothing really. We started doing our thing and it was more like an artistic, conceptual thing, even more that than a music thing actually. And then when the punk thing started up, I mean, it started up about the same time as us. You know, they didn't start and then we joined on. We all started up about the same time. When that started, that became like also a major influence. And it was also like, there's something about our attitude, which is it's the same as this. There's something about our bullshit attitude, our sort of like, we're not going to go on stage and be like musos and we're not going to... There was something about our kind of like rebel or reactionary attitude to what had been before that was exactly the same as what was coming out of London. But at the same time, I mean, we sort of recognised that we seemed to be part of this in our obscure, off-kilter, sort of arty way. You know, the Rosillos was the first band I was in. I was actually in two bands concurrently, but they were the first band. And, you know, I was very, I was very young. And the, the rest of the Rosillos had been in bands a long time before that. Um, but I felt that... Um, Basically, myself, Eugene, Joe, Angel Patterson and William Mysterious, there was other people as well in the early days like Gail Warning and things like that. There was kind of some, some sort of meeting of the minds, a sort of genesis of something. Um, that was my gang, really, and there were so many of them that there was enough of a gang. So, I met Eugene Reynolds and he was, um, at that time, he was at art college and he was a glass designer. And he was trying to show off to me and he broke a plate, a plate of glass over his head. And um, I thought that was really inspirational. So right away I thought, I want to be part of the gang this guy's hanging out with. Or I don't know what's going on with him, but I thought it was interesting. And he also said to me, so he said, yeah, I've got, you know, um, my favourite band is the Rosillos. And I said, oh, they're utter crap and they didn't even exist. And um, so there was kind of like this sort of banter started up. But I went to do the audition and I sang Sweet Jane, actually. Um, kind of just shown where you're... I, sh I sang Sweet Jane and a Shangri-La song. So, like, the direction and the... Where the band were coming from and where I was coming from was there, was there right from the start. We just got up and did it, really. I mean, there are other bands came, came up soon after that and, you know, that was really interesting, actually. But it didn't take that long for that to get going, but initially there was just, there was just us. Myself, Eugene and Joe all shared a flat and it was, um, <laughs> it was quite, an, uh, quite a chaotic and fun place to be in. We were always having water pistol fights and all the rest of it. And we had a joke together and everybody hung out there and we rehearsed there and ideas would come up that went into songs. Like There was always some bizarre humour going on and the ideas and the things that interested us. A permanent anti-musician. Whereas others of us, you know, sort of started learning things and we sort of, you know, I, over the years I sort of gradually became a singer. But Eugene is a permanent anti-musician. I really can't remember how he got involved, but I remember he wore a, an orange jumpsuit and he was on the road crew with a, cu a couple of other people. And, um, yeah, that's, he, was ju he just became part of the big 
Brazil's conglomerate in a way. Um, obviously he had ideas of his own. We were part of a movement, although we were like outliers of the sort of creative, arty off kilter ones, but we were part of a movement, so that brought lots of attention. Um, I think I heard bizarrely through the grapevine that, I know this is bizarre, but I think Elton John said to um, the head of Sire Records, who was Seymour Stein, you must see this band, they're great. And um, that's, what drew, that's what brought the attention to us. Um, but there was quite a few people interested in us at the time. I just think it's like being part of a movement, it was easy to draw that attention. Whereas if we had started up four years earlier or four years later, we would have drawn no attention, probably. An idea that they would actually be able to understand where we were coming from artistically. Um, and I think, you know, I think that at least was probably true. And I'll, I'll tell you that the evidence for that is that when I went to Sire Records, I went to the toilet and there was a, there was a shelf and it was full of Shangri-La's master tapes. So that was vindication. Mm. Maybe I was kind of like immune to surprises already by that time, I don't know, but I mean, if somebody had said the results have to get into a space capsule next week, I wouldn't have been altogether surprised. Um, but at the same time, you know, we were aware of the irony and the strangeness of the situation of us singing the song about Top of the Pops being on Top of the Pops. I mean, I remember being very interested in the other artists that were on. Um, I remember that I remember Boney M were on actually, and Chic I think Boney M were on, and that guy from Boney M said to, to Eugene Rails he thought he was dressed up in cool gear, which I thought was hilarious. Um, I, I, you know, it, it didn't seem extraordinary. It just seemed normal, and maybe that's a mark of my abnormality. I don't know. At that time, New, New York was a grungy hellhole, which was fantastic, you know, and I just like soaked up the way that it looked, the way it smelled. The dirt, I just loved it, basically. Um, CBG, CBGB's was fun, we played there. Um, something about the aesthetic of New York at that time, it's almost like, it was just so spot on for myself and Eugene, that's where we were coming from. Well, I think quite a lot of Edinburgh bands that have got that sort of aesthetic about them. You know, and I think it's a sort of, um, 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 Velvet Underground thing and, um, you know, I remember the fire engines supported the Rosillos in the early days, and yeah, they've definitely got something about them, about them. That was clear, and I always thought they were interesting. I thought they were adorable young young guys. No, no, I thought I thought they were brilliant actually. I really I really enjoyed their sets, and I can't remember them playing fifteen minutes though. Maybe that's my brain has done something to my memory there, but. Um, no, I, I really liked the racket they were making. I liked their attitude, and I think they had something, yeah. I don't know how much else you'd say. <laughs> but um, I, seriously, I, I, I don't. But there, there, was a, there was a lot of problems in the band, and we were very young and really stupid. I mean, the band um, just fell apart for, for lots of surfacey technical reasons, but there were other reasons there. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll start off with the surfacey ones, um, basically. Um, we had very bad fold back in those days and um, I lost my voice and Joe refused to turn down. Joe, you should have turned down. He refused to turn down on stage and it was just a, you know, it was an abysmal situation. I mean, you know, now I, I sing live all the time and I never lose my voice, but at that time I had quite a virgin voice. And um, we had a tour lined up and I'd lost my voice and it was just, oh my God. Um, at the same time, myself... Um, and Eugene, particularly me, had started writing. And um, I think Joe felt that he owned the writing situation in the Rosillas, and that caused a hell of a lot of conflict. And I, I personally couldn't cope with that at all. Um, so it's a shame, really, because I think a bit of a more sort of um, open attitude would have, would have saved the band, really. Um, at the same time, certain factions had started up, you know, I think that's extremely uncomfortable and unhelpful in bands, and I think that's one of the one of the ways in which Bob Last sort of failed the band, really, because he became part of a faction, which was the Road Crew and Bob Last and Joe and myself and Eugene on one side, and then like Angel Patters and that were just sort of floating around, but sort of not really knowing where to go, but more towards Joe, I guess. And so there was like splits occurring in the band, which were unnecessary and. Now, with maturity, you know, I just look back and think, oh, God, 
How stupid can you get? Well, going right back to the beginning, you have to remember the Rosillos as a concept was Eugene Reynolds' idea. And he is, yeah, you know, Mr. Conceptual. I mean, I should have said that in his Wikipedia. He is so, con you know, he has all these ideas and these concepts. So it was his idea, the whole way the band looked, the way everything was already conceptualised years ago. So, um, I mean, and by that time, uh, myself and Eugene had ve invested so much time and everything like that, we felt we had at least part ownership to the name, if not all, all ownership to it. And what, we decided to do something different, but to do something that was related to the Rosillos. And we, wa we wanted to do something that was right off kilter, which was more sort of influenced by things like Joe Meek, as well as all the girl group music that we had that was before, but like Joe Meek, eh? Uh, I'll probably upset a lot of Rosillos fans by saying the Rovillos was my favourite band. You know, being in a band can be great fun, but you don't join a band or do it because it's great fun. You do it because you're trying to do th something creative. And the Rosillos are in our, you know, a visually and musically and conceptually orientated thing. Um, so, I mean, the whole thing has been a struggle, but an interesting struggle. It's like taking a bit, big lump of mud or a lump of clay and trying to get something out of it. And it's not, we're, it's a continual struggle trying to get there. And I don't know if we'll ever get there, but the struggle is interesting.